Good evening. Are you guys excited? I am very excited because I'm going to be your guide to one of the great mysteries, the Star of Bethlehem. This, this has been a mystery for 2,000 years since the original events, and people have wondered about it for centuries, whether the star was a real event or whether it was something made up by the early church. And, you know, really, that's the two basic positions people have taken historically. Believers, some people believe the Bible is true, and they say, well, the star's in the Bible, so I'm good with it. They don't worry about it. But there are other people who have a more critical attitude towards the star, and uh, they read the story, and they say, wait a minute, that star is described as doing things that stars can't do. That must have been made up. You know, it's a myth created by the early church to add weight to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, those are the two pole, pole positions. We're not going to take either one of those this evening. What we're going to do is to treat the star more like a puzzle or a mystery to be solved. And we're going to go through the Bible and find all the clues we can there. And we're going to compare those against the facts we know from history and see if there's a matchup. And I think you're going to find this completely fascinating. Um, before I get off into the uh, whole presentation, I'll, I always like to tell people how I came to do it. So most people want to know that anyway. I'm not an astronomer. I'm a lawyer. Um, and so it's kind of strange that I'm doing this thing at all. But I got fascinated with the Star of Bethlehem, and it be became almost an obsession, and that's why I'm standing here. <laughs> so let me tell you how that happened. It began with a young man in our neighborhood who wanted to make some extra money, and he had this great idea of setting up Christmas decorations in people's yards. And he went door to door to everybody in the whole neighborhood. He's going to house to house and he gets to my house and he says, Mr. Larson, you're not going to put up the decorations. You're going to look at my book and pick a figure. So I look at the book and it's full of things like uh, duckies, you know, and, and bunnies carrying presents and things like that. And I'm a deeply committed Christian, so I, I just couldn't go there. I mean, so I just looked at the thing and I blew it. I declined. Everyone else in the neighborhood did it. And the result was that the whole neighborhood lit up with this unified theme come Christmas. People were driving in from out of town to drive through our neighborhood real slow, five miles an hour, all the kids looking out the windows and all that stuff. They get to the Larson house and it's dark. So I had to do something. And my little daughter, Marion, decided what we should do is make the three wise men. So we did. We made wise men stand about that high, draped them with cloth and all. They looked pretty cool. They march across my front yard every year at Christmas time. So when you have three wise men, what else do you have to have? You got to have the star. So Marion says, Daddy, make a star. And... You know, I immediately kick in with the, the lawyer's way of thinking. It's like, well, what was the star? If I'm going to make a star, what did it do? What did it look like? How long did it last? And what it, was it a shooting star? Was it a, did it explode? Was it an angel? I mean, what was the star? So I got sensitized to that question. Next thing that happened is I came across an article by a PhD astronomer that took the position the star was a real astronomical event. Fascinated me. Read the article. Most of it just went right over my head, you know, because I'm not, I'm not an astronomer. Didn't really understand it, but I kept it. Uh, and I actually put it aside and intended to look at it every year, just as almost like a Christmas tradition is what I was going to do. And I always thought in the back of my mind, someday I'm going to puzzle that stuff through. Astronomer or no, I'm going to figure that out. Next thing that happened to get me on the path to what I'm going to show you, my church asked me to teach a course called Essentials, which is the biblical basis for the core beliefs of Christianity. And so I'm writing the curriculum for Essentials, and I decided, um, well, why not put in just a little section in, in the Essentials course about external evidences, meaning uh, things outside the Bible that tend to show the Bible is true. And as I was putting that one together, the star came to me. I thought, my goodness, the star. The Star of Bethlehem, if that's an actual historical event, I mean, how about that for an external evidence? You know, so that turned me on totally. And I said, okay, now's the time. I'm not thinking about maybe someday, let's start. And so I bought some astronomy software. 
and for months, and it actually turned into years, I would go out on the deck after dark, after my girls had gone to bed, and I would go through that article, tap on my computer, look into the software, look at the sky, found everything in the article, eventually found a whole lot more, and, and a lot of stuff that I have to say <laughs> it's pretty darn close to shocking to me. In fact, the presentation, when I first gave it to uh, the Essentials class, basically dropped every jaw in the room. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'm going to have to show it to more people. So I decided to show it to my entire church. Same reaction. Then other churches started asking me. Pretty soon I'm getting requests from uh, all across the country, and even overseas. And I'm winding up going to Slovakia and Italy and all these places presenting the star because the interest is so high. It seems strange to me that he would ask somebody who's not formally trained in astronomy to do such a thing. But I guess maybe that's just the way he works. When, when people seem weak, then he gets the credit. It's basically taken over my life. You know, not, not really complaining, but it's a very big surprise to me what's happened with it. You might wonder, if the star is a real astronomical event, why are we just hearing about it right now? I mean, why isn't, the, why isn't it all disclosed in history books? Why haven't you already heard about it? Didn't you wonder about it? I, I wondered that. When I began finding all this stuff, I, I, I wondered, you know, why are we finding this stuff out now? So let me explain that a little bit. There's several reasons that I want you to know. First, we couldn't really know what the skies, ancient skies, looked like before we discovered the math behind the movements of the solar system. That happened in the 1600s. Anybody know who discovered how the solar system works? You hear Copernicus. He, Copernicus figured out that the, the sun was the center instead of the earth. The guy who figured out the actual math that drives the planets, that was Kepler, Johannes Kepler. And Kepler uh, puzzled out the three laws of planetary motion in the early 1600s. Now those laws hold today, they're math, and they're the same laws that NASA uses and the ESA uses to, uh, to predict where planets will be. When they launch a rocket and it has to travel for 13 years to get someplace, they know where the uh, uh, celestial bodies will be because it's all like a great clock. It's extremely regular, it's mathematically precise. Kepler discovered that in the 1600s. Before that, we couldn't calculate what the skies looked like in past times. But with Kepler's discovery, we can. Kepler discovered the math, but he did have a problem. I mean, uh, math is, uh, was laborious back then. It was done in your head or on paper, and you have a lot of calculations if you're trying to calculate the appearance of the night sky and all the stars in it. I mean, that's a lot of work. And the, the man used, you know, a quill pen and some vellum probably, and probably took a long time for him to draw a chart. Now, it would be accurate. His math was excellent. And he'd have an accurate picture, but it would be a snapshot. You know, and if he, if, he, if he calculated the appearance of the sky on the wrong day, or the wrong week, or the wrong hour for that matter, he might totally miss something very significant. But that all changed, you know, today. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're hearing about the star now, because we've taken that math and put it into software. You can see the night sky uh, from any place on the surface of the Earth, at any time in history, in an instant. And it's so fast, you can animate the sky. Kepler was a religious guy, and so the first thing he did, once he discovered these laws, first thing he did, he starts cranking those laws, trying to find, what, the star of Bethlehem. He wrote two books on it, but Kepler missed the star. And the reason he missed the star is he was looking in the skies at the wrong years. Here's the problem. Kepler had a mistaken understanding of first century history. He thought a very important man died on a certain date, and he was just wrong. The very important man was King Herod, the same King Herod who tried to kill the baby Jesus. So obviously Herod was alive when Jesus was born, and Kepler believed that Herod died in 4 BC, and so he only looked in earlier years. He looked in 5 and 6 and 7 BC for the star of Bethlehem. When you look in those years, you don't find much. It turns out that Kepler was taking his information from the writings of one Flavius Josephus. Josephus was a, a, a Jewish scholar. He wrote it about the same time that Jesus was on earth. And he wrote Jewish histories. And, and from the Josephus writings, it's possible to infer the date of Herod's death. I use that word infer because uh, he didn't use our dating system, our calendar system, so he couldn't just say 4 BC. But you can, you can infer the date of Herod's death from Josephus' writing. Kepler thought that inference should be 4 BC. But we have new knowledge. A man took an interest in this question of when Herod died. And this gentleman went and looked at manuscripts from Josephus. He looked at the, in the British Museum and our museums here in the United States, and he found that all of the oldest manuscripts, every one that dates before 1544, all of them, are consistent with Herod having died in 1 BC. Uh, some kind of a printing or copying error or something crept in 
and, and propagated from there. And so, it, actually, if you have a copy of Josephus on your shelf right now, it's probably going to be a 4 BC copy because it propagated widely. But all the early manuscripts, you know, are consistent with Herod having died in one. And that opens up the possibility for us to look in the years 2 and 3 BC for the star. And when you look there, the sky explodes. Now, a funny thing happened when I began to find all this stuff in that article and in a lot of other stuff, too. I was finding signs in the sky. Funny thing happened. I got cold feet. And I decided, I got to quit this. But let me tell you why. My parents are relatively conservative Christian people. And they taught me when I was just a kid not to fool around with astrology. They said, look, astrology is either just you know, entertainment, just false, or it's a cult. Neither one's good. And so they advised me just to stay away from astrology. Okay, so I'm outside on the deck, tapping away on my computer, finding all these signs, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I becoming an astrologer? That's when I shut down all the astronomical research for a time. I just didn't, I literally didn't do any more at all. I instead went and did an extensive Bible study on, on the stars in the Bible, because I wanted to know, that was what I'm doing okay. I mean, is it okay to look for signs in the sky, or is this weird? Let's go to the stars in the Bible. And we're going to learn that God takes credit for the constellations, takes credit for the stars. What's the oldest book in the Bible, anybody know? Probably Job. There's not complete agreement on that. There's some disagreement. But, but Job is likely the oldest book in the Bible. And most people think that Job was written before Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, before the founding of the Jewish nation. So it's an ancient, ancient book. Uh, and, and isn't it interesting that in the very oldest book of the Bible, we're already talking about stars, and God's taking credit for them. Let's have a look. In Job 9, Job is talking, he says, God is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south. Later in the book, God is putting Job in his place, and God says, hey, Job, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? The answer, no. He's saying, Job, I made the stars. I made the constellations. I'm running the show. I'm controlling it all. So here's God taking credit for the constellations and stars. Let's have a look and see what Isaiah says. Isaiah writes, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Incredible. He brings them all out. He has a name for all the stars. Uh, anybody in here ever seen a Hubble Space Telescope photograph? Raise your hands. I'm curious. Some, almost everybody has, but not everybody has. So I'm going to show you one to make the point. Um, let me give you something to look at while I'm talking to you. That's the Tadpole Galaxy, and I'll talk about it in just a second. Um, Hubble, if you don't know, is a, a, I call it a space telescope because it rides outside of Earth's atmosphere. So it doesn't have to look through our smog and haze and pollution and clouds, for that matter. It's out, out in the vacuum, and so it sees very clearly into very deep space. And since Hubble has existed, we've been able to we learn so much about deep space that we didn't have any clue before. For example, we have learned that there are at least 100 billion galaxies the size of our own Milky Way. And each of those galaxies has at least 100 billion stars in it. Feel small yet? This is the Tadpole Galaxy. And I'm showing it to you because it's pretty, but also because I want you to see all these little dots. If the room was darker, you'd see more, yet more. But all these little dots here, that you might, mis you might mistake those for stars. Those are not stars, those are galaxies. Each one of those has at least 100 billion stars in it, just like our Milky Way. Now, does, does that make the universe huge from God's perspective? I don't, I don't think it necessarily does, see, because numbers can be very uh, confusing. They can be misleading. Uh, my biologist friend of mine told me that I have 100 trillion cells in my body, not billion, trillion cells in my body. Does that make me huge? Well, I, I don't know. It depends on your frame of reference, doesn't it? So we don't know if God thinks the universe is big. God may say, the universe, universe, where did I put the universe? He calls them each by name. Because of God's great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. What does it mean to be missing? It means to be out of place, not where you belong. You mean all the stars, hundreds upon hundreds of billions of stars are right where God wants them? That's what Isaiah is saying. Now I'm going to show you something that David has said. Um, 
the thing that makes me just love him is his nickname in scripture. You know what he's called? He's called the man after God's own heart. I hear that and I think, oh man, I want that. You know, wouldn't you like to be a person after God's own heart? I mean, love the man, love him. Now, you probably have read this next psalm I'm going to put up here, but uh, you read it wrong. I want you to read it my way. I want you to read it for the verbs. David writes, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Now, isn't it interesting that David chooses verb after verb after Hebrew verb, all different, to say that the stars communicate? Fascinating. Now, in Romans, Paul is asking a rhetorical question. The rhetorical question is, did the Jews know the Messiah had come? Paul's kind of shocking answer was, yeah, of course they knew. But what I like is the structure of his argument. Look at his argument. Paul says, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard to the word of Christ. But I asked, did they, my people, the Jews, not hear? Of course they did. And then he quotes David. He says, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Let me just paraphrase that now. What Paul is saying, yeah, the Jews, my people, knew the Messiah had come because the stars told them. Now, do you make that argument unless something interesting has happened in the sky? You don't make that argument. <laughs> so obviously something did happen in the sky. What was that? That's what we want to know. That's what we're trying to find out. This last authority is, uh, is Jesus. He says there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. So is it okay to look for them? Well, I guess so. I guess so. But Mr. Larson, aren't you trying to play it both ways here? I mean, you say astrology is bad, but it's okay to look for signs in the sky? How does this work? You know, and you can't have it both ways, Mr. Larson. Oh, yes, I can. I'm a lawyer. I can make a distinction, right? Okay, and my distinction, I'm going to call a thermometer distinction. It's a metaphor, of course, and, 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 and thermometers... Everybody knows how they work. They can tell you if it's hot or cold, but they can't make you hot or cold because they're not active agents. They're indicators. That's how the Bible treats the stars. It was very reassuring. I, I quickly found out on, in that study that it's absolutely fine to look for signs in the sky. What's not fine is to think that the stars are running your life. That's astrology, and the Bible disagrees with that. In fact, um, there's such a distinction between astrology and what we're doing here that astrology was a kill on the fence in the Old Testament times. It was a capital offense. Okay, so we now know it's okay to look at the stars if we do it in the right way. Understanding they can be signs from on high, but they don't actually run your life. When I began uh, really pushing hard the research after having found the stuff in Craig Chester's article, I wanted to go further. So that means I had to really puzzle it through. You know, it's the only way I feel safe making a presentation is if I pushed it all the way back and I know what I'm saying is so and I've got the back end filled in. So I went to Matthew, and I treated it like it was the Bible. <laughs> I mean, that was the real set of clues right there. And, and most researchers don't pay that much attention to Matthew, only to the extent they see, oh, there was a star. They basically don't treat the Bible seriously. You know, they find out there's a star, they see Matthew chapter two, and then they throw away the Bible, you know, and just start looking around in the sky. And for that reason, Nearly everything in the night sky has been proposed as the star of Bethlehem at some point or another. Nearly everything. I wanted to go through and see, let's mine this for data. I'm looking for data points here. I'm looking for clues to solve a mystery. And so I went through Matthew very, very carefully and found that if you, were, if you pay close attention, there are nine characteristics of the star. That's a fair amount of data. When you have that much data, you can quickly eliminate a whole lot of things that other people are proposing. Why? Well, because I'm paying attention to Matthew. And I'm very conservative, too, about this issue. So if we find something in the sky that, you know, maybe fulfills eight, uh, I'm going to say, that's interesting, but it's not the star. It has to com completely line up with Scripture for me to think it's really the star. In fact, when you guys go, go home, if you get interested in this, you go home, you Google this deal, you're going to get a bunch of weird stuff coming up, you know, occult, strange, bizarre stuff. Fortunately, in most of the major search engines, my site's going to be very near the top because it's very well rated. So you can find my site, and I encourage you to go there. My site is called Bethlehemstar.net. So let's go to the second chapter of Matthew and look at the clues. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, so you see again how important it is when Herod died. If Herod died in 4 BC, you look in later years, but we think he died in 1, so we're looking in 2 and 3 BC. Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. Okay. 
Gotta ask, what's a magus? Same word root as our word magic. Are they magicians? You know, the one showed up in Acts and he was a bad actor, so some of them were bad. We don't know that much about the Magi. We don't even really know how many there were. We think there were three only because there are three gifts mentioned in Scripture. But we do know something about Magi, at least, because we have the writings of a Jewish philosopher and historian named Philo. Philo lived in Alexandria, Egypt, in the large Jewish community there, and he was a, 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 a copious writer. And his works have made it through to the present day. I've got a, you know, a huge compendium of, of Philo at home. Most first century histories have been lost. That's the truth, because we burned our, the world's major libraries in various conflicts over the years. But Philo made it through, and Philo does discuss magi. And he describes a particular school of magi. He calls it the Eastern School. And these magi, he praises. He says these guys understand the natural order, and they're able to explain the natural order to others. And, and we, they were, according to Philo, probably what we, we might call something like proto-scientists. They were the scientists of their day. At least this fancy Eastern school of Magi was of that character. Now, we don't know that these Magi in Scripture are from that Eastern school, but don't you think it's interesting that Matthew wants us to know they came from the East? I think he's telling us these Magi were from the good school. Impressive Magi. I have a theory about this Eastern school of Magi that perhaps they were descended from Daniel's day. Daniel never went home. He stayed there until he died and I'm sure was uh, training people to come up behind him. That may well be the Eastern School that gets described in Philo. The Magi asked a question that's just loaded, loaded with clues. They said, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Those three clues right there. Did you see him go by? Whatever the Magi saw in the sky suggested to them birth, the Jewish nation, and kingship. Next, they say, we saw his star in the east. I'm going to stop there because I have to correct the translation a little bit. When it says we saw a star in the east, okay, sure, they were in the east, and so yes, they saw his star when they were in the east, but that's not the sense of the Greek. The Greek says they saw the star on Anatole, which means rising in the east, and that's a clue, because most stars rise in the east because of the rotation of the earth, of course, but not all stars do that, like pole stars don't. So that's another clue. And then they say, and we've come to worship him. If the Magi were, in fact, of Jewish descent, that would explain why they'd be looking for Jewish signs in the sky and why they would be excited enough that what they saw to get on their camels and ride 700 miles to Jerusalem. And it, all, it would also explain why when they got to Jerusalem, in addition to asking questions, they wanted to worship the Jewish king. Who wants to worship a Jewish king? Perhaps someone of Jewish descent. Watch Herod's reaction. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Everybody who heard the story that the Magi presented was disturbed. That's a, that is a clue also. It's kind of a hidden clue. It comes back again in a few minutes, but let me just talk about that for a moment and tell you why it's a clue. Um, I'll back into it by getting you to participate. How many people in here have seen the Milky Way? And almost everybody here. But here's the deal. Um, the Milky Way is not visible in most parts of the country for several reasons, light pollution and air pollution being the two major ones. Um, but in ancient times, they had neither problem. Um, for example, they didn't have bright lights like this. The brightest thing anyone ever saw at night was a flame. So their eyes were adjusted. Plus, they didn't have air pollution, which cuts down visibility. They didn't have smog and stuff like that back then. As a result, they all had seen the Milky Way. Everybody had seen the Milky Way and were familiar with the stars and the constellations and all because the star, you know, was, they were perfectly available to the naked eye, unlike most of our cities. Another reason they knew about the, st the, the stars is it's a hot, arid place to live in the Middle East. And in the summertime, people used to sleep on their roofs. That way they got off the street level for a little bit of security and got the, out of the hot house and just get to lay there in the relative cool. And as you lay there on, on your back, what are you seeing? I mean, the internet, like you people? You know, no, they're looking at the stars all night, every night. As long as they're up, they're seeing stars. And so people understood the sky. Now here's why that's a clue. When they heard about the star from the Magi, they were shocked. That's a kind of clue, and I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. It appears twice. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. Now what's gonna happen is his chief priests and teachers, they're gonna quote the ancient prophet Micah. And it's a fateful prophecy too that Micah makes. In fact, if Micah hadn't made his prophecy, Herod wouldn't have killed all the little babies in Bethlehem. The king's experts say, in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet Micah has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. That's how Herod decided to kill the babies. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. That's the second time one clue is coming by. He doesn't know when the star appeared. He had to ask. That's an important clue. And then the next clue is that it's associated with an exact timing. 
okay? We're building up our nine points. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Two more clues. It went ahead of them as they went from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Let's do that one first. You may not know the geography of Israel. You don't need a map. You don't need a star. You don't need a guide to find Bethlehem from Jerusalem. It's five miles south on the main road. You can see Bethlehem from Jerusalem. So it's just five miles south, so we know the star, whatever it was, had to be ahead of them as they were headed due south. Okay? Oh, you know what? Else? There's another clue I have to pull out of this for you. Remember that they saw the star when they were in the east, and then they traveled to Jerusalem, and then they saw the star still? That means the star endured over time. And then here's the tough one. Here's the toughest of all the nine points. Until it stopped over the place where the child was. Can a star stop? You wouldn't think so, but it can and did, and I'm going to show you. You now know more about the star than any of your neighbors. I promise you, you now know the nine points that identify the star. So I'm going to give you a little quiz here. Don't worry, you'll do great. Um, first, might the star have been a shooting star, a meteorite? No, I agree with you. Not. Well, why not? There are probably six or eight reasons why. Doesn't stop, right? Shooting stars don't do that, right? Gone for two seconds. Okay, what about, uh, it's not a shooting star, what about a comet? I'll answer that one for you. Comets are a better candidate because they rise in the east like other stars. They, they uh, uh, endure over time. They can be spectacular. Some of them have tails that could be taken to point. That's kind of cool. Um, but I don't think it was a comet. I got basically three reasons for thinking that. First one is kind of soft science, but it's just the fact that from the earliest recorded human history, and by that I mean cave paintings, from the very earliest times, comets have been omens of doom. That's how humans conceive of them, because they operate outside the normal system. They come from nowhere, it seems like. Uh, you know, so in the earliest cave paintings, if there's a comet in there, in the cave painting, all the animals are running from it. And even in the 20th century, even, even as far as that uh, uh, modern a time, people still thought comets were omens of doom. The first time Halley showed up in the 20th century, all the churches packed. Everybody thought, well, you know, the world was ending. So what I'm thinking is probably wasn't a comment. I mean, would God choose an omen of doom to announce the coming of Messiah? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. It doesn't seem likely. But there are other reasons not to think it, to think it was not a comment. Um, several ancient cultures kept excellent astronomical records, notably the Chinese. You go to the records. You look in the years 2 and 3 BC, which is our hypothesis. No comments. But I, the one that persuades me the best, the one that I think is the strongest evidence that it wasn't a comment, is that's kind of a funny clue where Herod was surprised about it. Herod didn't know when the star appeared. He had to ask. And that's really fascinating to me because it, that just suggests that it may have been an ordinary thing in the sky that was striking when explained. When the Magi put it in context and said what was happening and had been happening for the last nine months, I think that's what blew him away. Look, if a comet appears in that ancient culture where everybody sees the sky most and every night, is, are people going to know about it? Yeah, and it's an omen of doom. It's going to be the talk in the town. I mean, everybody's going to be buzzing about it. So... Probably not a comet. Well, how about a nova, an exploding star? Now, they appear at a point in time. That's good. Last over time. They rotate. I mean, I should say they rise in the east. Probably not a nova, though, for the same reasons. You look at the Chinese records, there aren't any nova I recorded. And also, Herod would not have had to ask. You know, if, if the thing appears, everyone's going to know. So have we wiped out everything? No, we haven't. There's another class of things. We have one class of stars that we call wandering stars. Uh, we, today, moderns call them planets, but that word comes from the Greek verb to wander. Uh, they're called wandering because they move around in the field of fixed stars. When you go outside and look up tonight, you're going to see just this huge canopy of stars. We often visualize it as a sphere over the Earth. Um, and those stars, most of them in, the, in that sphere, they move very, very slowly. Of course, it's really us that's moving, but the Earth rotates, and it makes the stars appear to rise in the east and set in the west, right? Most stars, then, are in the, in the fixed class, but then there are the wandering stars, the planets. And the planets move around through the field of fixed stars. They do interesting things. So might one of these wandering stars have something to do with Messiah's star? Well, that's going to be our working hypothesis. Um, anybody tell me what's the largest planet in the solar system? That's Jupiter. Jupiter's named for the highest god in the Roman pantheon. Uh, it's a gas giant, we call it. It's the biggest planet by far. It's about 11 times the diameter of Earth. It's, you know, hundreds of times more massive. Runs in an in in orbit way outside of Earth. It takes about 12 years to get around the sun. So might Jupiter, which has been known as the king planet from ancient times, because it's the biggest one, 
Um, might Jupiter have something to do with Messiah's star? Well, that's going to be a hypothesis, the hypothesis that we can test. Now, it's not going to be enough to have a kingly name. Jupiter's going to have to do some pretty peculiar things to satisfy all nine points from the Bible. So did Jupiter do that? So now I'm going to take you and show you the starry dance. We're going to go to the sky and see what really happened 2,000 years ago. This uh, program, incidentally, is uh, uh, called Starry Night. And uh, it's a fabulous program. I'm only going to use it just a little here today to show you something spectacular. But if you're interested in astronomy, it's great stuff. Used widely by astronomers around the world. It is extremely accurate. It incorporates Kepler's uh, three laws of planetary motion. Plus, N Newton refined Kepler's work. He added something called perturbations. Uh, and so, and that's all included in the, the software. So what I'm going to be showing you through these screens is not something that approximates what things looked like in ancient times. It's quite an accurate reproduction of the positions of the planets because we can actually calculate that. So um, we can view from any place we like. I'm choosing to view from Babylon because I believe that's probably where the Magi came from. That's the Eastern School. And now most everybody in this room knows that Babylon's in Iraq. People didn't used to know that, but now everybody's very familiar. It's about 60 miles south of Baghdad, right? Um, and you can choose to choose any time to view, and we're view, viewing 3 BC, it's September. This is the compass rose, it says east, and this red line is the path of Jupiter through the sky. I've turned it on just to make it easier for you to follow Jupiter. Now when I animate the sky, what's gonna happen is you're gonna watch the screen increment, and it's gonna kinda do it stepwise, and what's happening in between those steps is the program is running through all that math to make sure that exactly what you, know, what you see is exactly what happened. So let's take a look, and we see Jupiter rising. Oh, cool, Mr. Larson. There better be more, right? <laughs> I got this more, there's more. I'm, I'm already messing with you, though, because there are actually two things here. Can you see the two objects there? Let me take you to another screen so I can enlarge it without messing this screen up. I'm just going to zoom in. And as I zoom in, you'll find that there are two objects there. This is Jupiter. The smaller object is a star. It has a name. It's called Regulus. That's the same word root as our word regal. The Babylonians called Regulus uh, Sharu, which means king. The Romans called Regulus Rex, which means king. This is the king star. We now have the king planet and the king star coming into very close approach. So I'm out there on the deck and I'm typing away and I find this and I think, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, you know, I can see king there. Well, that was interesting. It was. That was a conjunction. It was interesting. But it also made me... Mm, suspicious, you know, because I, like I say, I'm a lawyer and I'm not an astronomer and I didn't want to be fooled. I don't want to find something that turns out to not have any significance at all. Maybe that happens every Thursday, you know? So I started running the universe backwards and forwards just trying to find out how often do these conjunctions happen. Here's the situation. Let's just use, make some assumptions to put this in context for you. I don't know, uh, how old any of the Magi were, but let's just make some assumptions. Let's say you have to be an apprentice to become a Magi, Magus. Let's say that uh, you make the, make the grade by age 20 or something. Then you got maybe 50 years until your eyes go bad and you can't observe anymore. Um, so let's say they had 50 year careers. And let's put them in mid-career, just making some assumptions here. If that was the case, and if they were watching, weather permitting, if they were watching, they might have seen something like this two or three times before. So somewhat rare, somewhat interesting. Yeah, make a note of it. That's what they were into. But uh, probably wouldn't send them to Jerusalem. Probably not. But of course, there's more. Now, I'd already told you that wandering stars move about in the field of fixed stars, right? But um, they, don't, they don't do it correctly. <laughs> Just so you'll know, the planets misbehave. Let me show you what they do. Uh, here's what it looks like. Well, here's what Mars is, uh, looks like as it moves through the fixed stars. It moves along like you'd expect it to, but then it slows down and loops continues on a ways, and loops again. Well, what's with that, Mars? That's pretty weird, isn't it? Okay, I mean, it's looping through the sky like that? That's exactly what it looks like, but of course it's optical. It's what uh, astronomers call retrograde motion. Retrograde motion. It's caused by the fact that we're watching from a moving platform. Just like when you uh, are driving your car and you pass somebody on the roadway, they appear to drop back. Uh, they're not really going backwards. You're just watching from a moving platform. Same thing. We're watching from Earth. And so when Earth spins past another planet in its orbit, the planet may appear to act strangely, move backwards, retrograde motion. And Jupiter does that, of course. Jupiter's retrograde is very shallow, if I can get my star to go on. Jupiter goes like this. It slows up. It doesn't blink like that. And it does a very shallow little circle, kind of a 
little like that. Yeah, it kind of looks like a halo or somebody. So did Jupiter do that at an interesting time? Well, yes, it did. Let's take a look. I'll animate Jupiter and let it drop a tail so you can watch it. Jupiter passed Regulus, changed its mind, stopped and went back for a second close approach. That's two. Passed Regulus again, changed its mind, and came back for a third close approach. Triple conjunction, much more rare, much more rare. And if you choose to see it, Jupiter has just drawn a halo or a crown over the king planet. Interesting. I can see king there, can't you? I can see king, 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 right? Some people would say, well, king, 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 you know, new king, or maybe it means birth. I don't know. I, I can't get much more out of that, but I do see king there. Very sure. A lot of stuff still missing, though. I mean, I don't see the Jewish nation up there any place. So, of course, there's more. Next, I want to ask you a question. Um, Twelve Jewish tribes. One produces Messiah. Which one? Anybody know? You're right. Say it louder. It's Judah. That's right. What's the animal symbol for the tribe of Judah? That's correct. Okay, good. Let me take you to the first book of the Bible. Look at Genesis 49 for a prediction of the coming Messiah. We read, You're a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom the scepter belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. I need a prop. I'm going to use this for a prop. Y'all know what a scepter is? The thing that kings hold to show that they're kings, right? I want you to remember the scepter because it's going to show up again. Okay, so this is a prediction of Messiah coming in his role as king of, of king of kings. Well, that association with the Lion of Judah, that helps us. Let's go back to the sky. If we look at the sky and turn on the constellations, we'll see that Jupiter has been crowning Regulus right here in the constellation Leo the Lion. Well, now I can see an association with the Jewish nation. I can see King 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 in Leo. Well, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. But there's something even bigger that I got to show you that really spooked me when I saw it. And to do that, I'm going to take you back to the Bible, to the last book of the Bible. We've just been in the first book of the Bible. Now we're in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And I want to talk a little bit about Revelation first and about its author, because I want to make sure you're all on the same page. Um, it was written by a man named John. Uh, he wrote five books of the New Testament, including the Gospel. He wrote Revelation when he was an old man. He, 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 and, and under dire circumstances, the guy was uh, on the island of Patmos, basically locked up for his Christian beliefs. And he was there, most commentators think, for six to nine months and basically solitary on a rocky island. And he was old at that point, maybe probably in his 80s, maybe almost, could it even be 90s? And that's when he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, now all of you who've read it, you know it speaks in a swirling prophetic imagery, you know, and it's a, it's, a lot of it seems metaphorical. Sometimes it's not chronological. It's a difficult book. It's a difficult book to interpret. But uh, I can't explain most of it. I can, though, explain a little. I'm going to go to Revelation 12 and show you a corner that I think I understand. Let's take a look and see what John describes. He says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. What is the sign? Well, I want you to watch this. It's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. If you understand this, please email me, okay? His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Hey, here's that scepter again. Who's the child? That's Jesus in his role as king of kings. We saw the, pre the prediction in Genesis, and here in Revelation, he appears again, and he's got that scepter, because he's now the king of kings. So, if the child is Jesus, who's the woman? Yeah, that's pretty easy. Okay. And in, in, in metaphorical terms, who's the dragon that waited at the, at the foot of the woman to devour the child? That's Herod. The dragon is Herod. John elsewhere tells us in Revelation that the, the dragon is Satan, but we know in human terms it was Herod. So we now understand what he's describing is the birth of Jesus, but he sees it in the heavens. I'm going to show you something now that definitely got all little hairs up on the back of my neck and the back of my arm. and Because uh, what follows Jupiter into the sky as we animate the sky is Virgo, the virgin. And she's clothed in the sun. 
and she has the moon at her feet. It's just a crescent moon, a very small crescent, barely a visible moon. There's a reason for that. This is Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. The sheer weight of symbolism in the sky on this day blew me away. In September of 3 BC, when Jupiter is coming in a close conjunction with Regulus, the king planet and the king star, that happening in Leo, the lion representing the nation of Judah, the tribe of Judah, that rises in the sky and behind it rises Virgo, the virgin, and she's clothed in the sun and she has the moon at her feet. It's exactly what John described in Revelation 12. It's what he saw in his vision. It's obvious. That got me. When I went on the time forward and saw that rise and realized, oh my goodness, that's what John saw. There it is. That really let all the hairs come up. So I'm looking at all this stuff happening, you know, and I'm, everything's just, you know, really moving me. And I'm thinking, man, if we, this may be the birth of Jesus. And then I thought, wait a minute, maybe not. Because Jewish people and a lot of Christian people believe that uh, life begins at conception. So I thought to myself, well, this might, maybe this is the conception of Jesus. Maybe this is the, the, the Annunciation, when Gabriel appeared to Mary and, and, and she said, be it done unto me. Well, you can test that. I thought, well, let's just wind forward nine months and see if there's anything uh, interesting happening in the sky. So that's what I did. So let's jump forward nine months. Now, we're still reading from Babylon because uh, I don't think they've left yet. <laughs> it's now 2 BC. It's, it's June. It's nine months later. Jupiter has finished crowning Regulus in Leo and is now moving backwards through the constellations like it always does. I'm going to melt the sunset because I need the sky to be darker. You can see it setting in the west, of course, like everything does because it's the rotation of the Earth. Incidentally, if you're in Babylon and you're looking west, what are you looking toward? Israel. Okay, now I'm going to show you something that you can see in any planetarium around the world. Even if they don't believe in Jesus or you know the Bible or anything, they're going to show you this at Christmas. Because all planetaria do Christmas shows. That's the only way they can get you in there, right? Um, and they always show this event because this event is simply so spectacular. Whether they believe in God or not, they're going to show you this, this shot. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat as I show it to you, though, because uh, observation back then was all naked eye observation. They had no lenses. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to zoom in because I want to show you guys. I'm going to take you in on the secret of what's happening here. And they couldn't zoom, but we can. So I'm going to zoom in way in. Until finally I get those two objects separated. One of them's Jupiter. The other one's another planet. You're going to tell me which one too. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. That's the mother planet. Venus is the mother planet. So we have Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet, coming into very close conjunction. That seems kind of pregnant, doesn't it? In fact, they got even closer than that. Let me wind time forward just a little bit. What I'm trying to show you is that they really stacked like a figure eight. So they didn't block each other's light. They added what you had then was two stars stacked on top of each other, too close together to separate with the naked eye. And so to an observer, it appeared to be the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Um, you, we know the math, and so I can tell you that no one alive had ever seen a star that bright. That was it. I believe the star of Bethlehem was the brightest star. So we've seen the birth of a king in the sky. We've seen the brightest star. But now we have the issue of it being in the south. Remember when they were traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the star is said to have been before them, ahead of them. In the, so it would have to be in the southern sky. So let's go back to the sky, see if Jupiter did that. They've now traveled to Jerusalem. It's November. I've given them some time for travel. This is south. Remember, uh, Bethlehem is due south in Jerusalem. And at 7 in the morning, sure enough, there in the sky, in the southern sky, is Jupiter over the little town of Bethlehem. Now the hard part, though. Can a star stop? How can a star stop? That was a puzzler. Because we all know stars can't stop. I mean, physics and inertia prevent that. So I puzzled all of that hard. I worried about that one until I realized that I had the problem upside down. And I had it backwards. The problem is not that stars can't stop. The problem is that all stars are always stopped. I mean, they move like the hour hand on your watch. You can't see it. You know it's moving, but you can see it move. Well, if the problem is that stars 
or all was stopped, what can Matthew have meant by saying the star stopped? And then I thought, retrograde motion. Because, of course, stars do stop. Planets do in, in their movement through the field of fixed stars. They stop. They even reverse course. And that's how I think retrograde motion explains what the star stopping was. So did Jupiter do that? Let's have a look. I'll animate Jupiter and let it drop a tail. And there you see it. Sure enough, Jupiter comes to a full stop and reverses course over the little town of Bethlehem. But I want to show you another screen that's more fun because I can throw dates with it. Now what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to let Jupiter fly through the field of fixed stars and it's going to throw off dates so we can tell when these events are happening. The first one there, I know it's small, I'll read it for you. It says 1030 of 2 BC. Now let's fly Jupiter. You see it moving through the fixed stars. There it says 1125 of 2 BC and it's slowing up. It's going to stop right about here, reverse course. The date when it stopped over the little town of Bethlehem, 1225 of 2 BC. Does that date sound familiar? Well, Mr. Larson, you mean they, they went down there on Christmas? Well, it turns out that's true. Um, am I saying that Jesus was born on 1225? No, I'm not saying that at all. Absolutely. In fact, I don't think anyone thinks that. No, I, what I'm saying is that that is quite literally, quite possibly the date of the first Christmas. Did it have any meaning to them? No, it had no meaning. The date had no meaning to them because they didn't even use our calendar system. I mean, but it does have meaning to us. It could well be assigned to us. Um, let me give you, give you the chronology now. In September of 3 BC, Jupiter crowns Regulus in Leo, uprises Virgo, clothed in the sun, new moon birthed at her feet, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Nine months later, the biggest planet goes together with the brightest planet to make the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Where? Right over Jerusalem as it sets. The Magi ride. They get there uh, sometime around November. They go to Herod and they say, we've seen the star, where's the baby king? Uh, Herod says, uh, Bethlehem. So they're leaving uh, the gates of Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem, five mile trek. Uh, and they look up and there's the star, there's Jupiter, right over this little town of Bethlehem. One of the guys is the guy who does the math for the group. He's going, wait, 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 wait. It's in full retrograde, it's stopped right over the little town of Bethlehem. They ride down to the Bethlehem in 1225, 2 BC. We know that's the date because that's when the star stopped. They're carrying gifts, remember? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. They find the baby boy. Is he uh, living in a manger? No, 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 no. He's moved. He's in, a, he's in a house now. He's described in Greek as a pideon. He's a toddler. They find the baby boy and they present these fabulous gifts to him on what turns out to be the first Christmas, 1225 of 2 BC. And now I've shared with you the star of Bethlehem, but now I'm going to reveal something to you. It turns out in my studies, I find that the star of Bethlehem is the beginning of what I think of the celestial poem that ends at Christ's death. And to show you the full poem, I've got to take you to the day of the cross. I'm going to talk to you about Pentecost, but first I kind of have to give you some background so you'll understand. Um, the, Jesus was killed at Passover. The next Jewish holiday is a feast. It's called the Feast of Pentecost. It's called Pentecost because it comes 50 days after Passover, so it's Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is a festival, and people, Jews who could afford to travel came from all the surrounding nations, came back to Jerusalem for this festival, so a lot of out-of-towners in town. Let's do the chronology of, of, of Christ's death. Remember, he dies on Passover, he's buried, he rises again. The Bible says that he then appears to people on earth, stays around for 40 days. So he almost makes it to Pentecost, doesn't he? Then he leaves and he gets instructions and he says, stay here until you receive power from on high. So they do. The disciples stay in one place and they're all gathered together and Pentecost comes and the weirdest things start happening. Something like a sound of rushing wind happens in the room where they are. Something like fire dances over their heads and suddenly the disciples begin to speak in foreign languages, other tongues. People who are in town for the Pentecost feast hear the commotion, the crowd starts to gather and these out-of-towners are hearing their own languages being spoke, spoken by a bunch of Galilean fishermen. It gets crazy. Some, the crowd gets big enough that there are hecklers in the back. And one of the hecklers shouts out, says, Oh, they're just drunk. Peter stands up and says, They're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Now, I, I lecture to a lot of college students, and I'm wondering, this is persuasive? You know. So he, the next thing he does, don't try on, on your own. You know, he, what he does next is crazy. He's got a huge crowd, and it's kind of an unruly crowd. He's got hecklers and stuff. And so Peter stands up, and he starts quoting an ancient prophet. This is what he says. He quotes Joel. He says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. 
blood, well, there's been a crucifixion. Fire, something like fire danced over the disciples' heads. And billows of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness. I think Joel saw a vision of something like smoke that blotted out the sun. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. The moon turned to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he shouts at him. He says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now, let me tell you why I put italics there. That's a, that's a very interesting argument. Let me paraphrase what just happened. Got a rowdy crowd out here. Peter stands up and he says basically this, Joel predicted a bunch of stuff and you've seen it. Now, you don't make that argument, especially to a rowdy crowd, unless they've seen the stuff. And one of the things they are said to have seen was a blood moon. Y'all know what a blood moon is? I thought that was weird. I thought that was just weird prophet talk. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You, have you ever read and you see something in scripture and it just it strikes you as so strange, like the moon would be turned to blood and say, oh, okay. You know, it just sounds like prophet talk and I didn't know what it meant, but it turned out I was very wrong. That's a technical term. It's an ancient technical term and it has a specific meaning. It means a lunar eclipse. Why do they call those blood moons? Because when a moon goes into eclipse, it goes into Earth's shadow. And so it gets no direct illumination from the sun. Instead, the only light that hits the moon under those conditions is refracted through the Earth's atmosphere, it's red shifted, same thing, the, the similar phenomenon makes our sunsets red sometimes. So when the light comes through our atmosphere and it's red shifted, it illuminates the moon, which becomes a dull red color. Have you ever seen one of those? Yeah, pretty spectacular, aren't they? It can be. Well, um, here's the just, just what we've just seen. Peter says that Joel said that there's a blood moon and you've seen it. So there was an eclipse. Interesting. Now we need to date Christ's execution. The, the, the reason we have to do that is otherwise we won't know what to look at the sky. We, we need to know what day we should study the sky to see the, the end of this poem that I'm showing you. So we have clues. Um, incidentally, let me make another, make another pitch for my website here, Bethlehemstar.net. The reason I'm pitching it again right here, there's a whole lot of really fascinating stuff on the website about this issue, the dating of Christ's execution. First, we know it was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. Okay, some of you may not know what preparation day means. Jews of this time, if they were observant Jews, could not work on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. They couldn't cook, they couldn't wash clothes. So if they wanted to eat, they had to prepare it on Friday. And so Friday came to be called preparation day. So all four gospels say that Jesus was killed on a Friday. Next clue, it was just before the Passover feast. Now, that's super useful because we know when Passover is, we find from Leviticus, the Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. That's the Jewish lunar month of Nisan. The, the Jewish calendar is not a solar calendar like the one we use. So those three clues taken together are extremely powerful. And let me explain why. Because um, their lunar calendar works like our solar calendar in some ways, and this is one of them. Think about your birthday. It's always on the same day of the month, right? Is it always on the same day of the week? No, because in a solar calendar and in the lunar calendar, days of the month can float through the days of the week. Our calendars are alike in that. But that's a clue. It's a huge clue. Because now you can see Jesus must have been killed in a year when Nisan 14 happened to fall on a Friday. Can you see that? Okay, that really narrows things down. Let's get some more clues up there. Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. John recounts three Passovers during Christ's ministry. And we know he was taken before Pilate. And we know when Pilate sat because Tacitus, the Roman historian, records it, 26 to 36 AD. So all these things taken together, plus more stuff on the website, come to one conclusion. Only April 3 of 33 AD seems to fit all the lines of evidence. This is the day of the cross. Isaiah says the Messiah was beaten so severely he was hardly recognizable as human. And in that state, they put him on the cross at 9 a.m. He only lasted about six hours. But while he was on the cross, all hell broke loose. <laughs> big earthquakes, big enough to bust boulders because the New Testament tells us that. 
the sky gets dark at noon. Joel, in his vision of this event, seems to describe billowing clouds of smoke that obscured the sun. Tombs get shaken open. There's a veil in the Holy of Holies, in the, the temple at Jerusalem, it separates the deepest part of the sanctuary from all the people who come to church, synagogue. Um, that was ripped in half, from top to bottom, symbolizing ordinary folks having direct access to the Holy of Holies, to God himself, because Messiah's sacrifice made it possible. They had to get him down off the cross before sundown. They had to do that, because otherwise he would defile the Passover. So they got him down. But the signs didn't stop. When the moon rose that evening, it was a blood moon, a lunar eclipse, which probably scared everybody there to death. <laughs> I mean, I can really honestly think, having lived through all of those events and then seeing the blood moon, being scared spitless. When the moon rises, it's already in eclipse. It's a blood moon. Now, I don't know what the Roman soldiers said when they saw that, but don't you know they were freaked out? I mean, seriously. After all these events during the day and then the moon comes up and it's a blood moon, they're probably thinking, oh man, wrong side of this one. But there's more, and I want you to see it all. To show you what else there is, I need to take you back to Scripture. Because I want to get some data from Mark. I'm jumping around in the book, because all I want is, is the time of day. It was the third hour when they crucified him, Mark tells us, and Mark counts from six, so he's telling us he went, he went on the cross at nine a.m. At the sixth hour, which is noon, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Now, nobody wore wristwatches, but Jesus died at about three. Let's go back to the sky. Now, can you see if the moon rises in eclipse, that eclipse has to have begun beneath the horizon. If it's already an eclipse, okay. Well, of course, they couldn't look beneath the horizon, but we can, we have software. So I'm not taking it beneath the horizon. It's 2 p.m. Jesus is on the cross and he's still alive. When I animate the sky, I don't think you're gonna be surprised at what you see. As Jesus expires on the cross, the moon goes into eclipse, but there's more. To show you what else there is, I need to remind you of the skies of Jesus' birth or perhaps conception. Magnificent imagery, Jupiter, crowning Regulus, in Leo, uprises Virgo, the Virgin, clothed in the sun, new moon, Rosh Hashanah, spectacular. And now we turn to the sky of Christ's death and turn on the constellations. And you see the moon has returned to the foot of Virgo. But now it's a full moon, a life fully lived, blotted out in blood. I remember the night when I found the eclipse at Christ's crucifixion. I remember it because of what was happening to me. When I found that the moon was back at the foot of the Virgin, and then when I further found that the moon went into eclipse at the moment my Savior expired on the cross. And I remember exactly what I said. I don't think I could ever forget it. I looked up at the sky and I said, my God, what did you do? Because this is poetry of terrible beauty. It showed me a side of God that I'd not seen. It showed me a God that would write poetry to record both the coming and the passing of my Messiah. And then he let me find it.
So what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, human beings have a characteristic response when they see a sign. They draw near to learn the fuller message. That's what Moses did when he saw the bush that burned but wasn't consumed by the flames. He drew near to learn the fuller message. It's what the Magi did when they saw the symbolism in the sky. They rode for Jerusalem to learn the fuller message. So what does this mean? Well, one thing it means is you can press the scriptures extremely hard and they hold up. But it means more than that. I believe it means Messiah has come. Our Messiah was announced in the sky. It's possible for us to have reconciliation with the perfect God because of Messiah's sacrifice. We just have to accept that. It might mean even more than that. Because if we found the star and a reasonable person could conclude that we have, well, then the star was part of the natural order. The solar system is like a great clock. It's mathematically precise. We know exactly what it looked like thousands of years ago. And if the star was a part of that great clockwork solar system and universe, that means it was a clockwork star. And that, to me, is almost overwhelming, because that means that from the very moment that God flung the universe into existence, he had to know exactly when he would enter the human race as a man and when Messiah would expire on the cross, because he marched in the stars from before time.